Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, midweek supplemental episode number 187. I'm your host, Bob DeMarco, and today we're going to talk about Arno Bernard knives. We're going to be talking about something happening uh, with knife rights in Illinois. Uh, my state of the collection, I have three new knives that I've been uh, so thrilled about the last week. I've spoken about them in other places, and today we'll we'll dig in a little bit. And then uh, we're going to talk about the top 10 knives in my collection that have been with me the longest. Now, uh, some of them are pretty old, but uh, the criteria is not my oldest knives, because I have some uh, acquired some antiques and things that are older than some of these. Uh, but these have been with me the longest, and that's for a reason. I've given a lot of knives away. I've sold a lot of knives, uh, but these ones persist and have stuck with me. So we're going to get into those. Uh, but before we do any of that, we're going to, well, we're going to do a pocket check. My uh, weekly opportunity to show off what I'm carrying. And today I have the ridiculous but charming... Medford Praetorian in my pocket. Uh, this knife I don't carry too often, but when I do, it is a, it's an exciting experience. Look at this chunk. It, it's an audacious knife. You look at this and it's, you know, it took a, a lot of chances and somehow succeeded, even with that uh, crazy broad blade and super thick blade. Uh, this Tanto is hollow ground and it's very, very sharp. Uh, very thin behind the edge, though you do hit quite a wide shoulder at the top of that hollow grind. Uh, this is the G10 version and uh, D2. You can tell by the D on the blade, and it's a titanium frame lock, and it has this more simple sculpted titanium clip on it, and I prefer that. Uh, the other clip that uh, I think was the original clip and the one that you see most is much wider and has an opening in it, like a big hole in the middle. And it just isn't, uh, I don't know, pleasing to me. I'm sure it works great though. Um, I have used this glass breaker, luckily not in an emergency, but you can see it's marred. Let's see, it's marred right there. Uh, I used this in my uh, glass breaking test video from last summer, uh, including that and the um, micro or the, uh, the Microtech and a number of other knives I have with glass breakers. And let me say this giant hunk of diamond shaped steel with this giant hunk of knife backing it up did quite well. So if you ever need to break glass, make sure you have a, a Praetorian on you for sure. Uh, the other knife I'm carrying today, you know, I always kind of have a bit of a contrast going is the uh, Great Eastern Cutlery number 65, Ben Hogan in clip point here clip point blade with the cloud shield and the uh, tortoise shell. I love me some tortoise shell. And uh, when I saw this come out, I watched the Rob Bixby Apostle P video on it. He had a whole history about this knife, about this pattern, the Ben Hogan. It's a copperhead. If you look at the bolster here, the bolster is copperhead shaped meaning it swells up a little bit right here where your finger goes, as, acting kind of as a guard, but it's also a very long bolster from stem to stern, so it gives a lot of support to that blade. And that's a long blade. It's, what is this, three and a half inches or so? So on a slip joint, on a non-locking knife like this, if you have a long bolster, like a Barlow-style bolster or a copperhead bolster, it's going to give more lateral stability to the blade. Uh, well... At least that's what they say. Uh, and this is uh, this is one of my prized GECs. It is my fancy dinner steak knife. So uh, if I'm going to a fancy restaurant, which of course I haven't done in almost a year now, and uh, even before last March 2020, I wasn't often going to fancy restaurants, but whenever there was a chance I'd be eating a piece of meat, I would bring this knife with me. And that's a uh, food patina there on, the, on this beautiful 1095 blade. That patina there is all from meat and the occasional peanut butter and jelly sandwich, perhaps. So uh, that's what I'm carrying today. And what I was carrying yesterday was the zero tolerance. Let me show this. 
is the old beautiful Zero Tolerance Zero 0200. And the reason I was carrying this is, uh, well, uh, coming up this Sunday on the interview show, we have Ken Onion. Spoke to Ken Onion, and uh, I had to carry my favorite Ken Onion knife, at least in my collection, and that's this. Uh, such a great knife. He's a great guy, has so much uh, experience, insight, and uh, I don't know, just a lot to offer. We had an interesting conversation, uh, avoiding a lot of biographical material to get to more, well, you know, industry material. So it was a it was a great conversation. Ken Onion is a cool guy living the life out in Hawaii. Hawaii seems to be quite a knife state. Uh, Ed Cope, um, uh, Stan Fujisaka, Les George was there for a while. Got Ken Onion. Um, uh, I know I'm missing someone major, um, but anyway, uh, major knife state. It just occurs to me, uh, kind of like Oregon, kind of like California, kind of like New York. Mm. Pennsylvania as well. Virginia could have been, but our governor decided that ah, that wasn't the right optic. So no Virginia in the knife world right now, but who knows, maybe someday, maybe someday uh, if we play nice or something like that. Um, so I want to show you something that I just ordered. They just came in and man, I'm in love. I'm going to put them under the knife can here, knife cam, so you can have a look, look-see. All right. If you're listening, what viewers are looking at is a beautiful Knife Junkie t-shirt with a giant Knife Junkie logo on the front. We also have, uh, and these are available on the website, we also have uh, a whole, and it's not just t-shirts, it's all sorts of stuff you can get this logo on. You know, it's 2021, people. Uh, Jim also designed this really cool uh, logo for Don't Take Dull for an Answer. So we have a whole uh, line of Don't Take Dull for an Answer uh, gear in both black, you know, black background, a dark background and motif, and then a white or light background and motif. And they're really cool. And those are on the way. I ordered uh, five of these and then five of those. And uh, I also am getting uh, something else with the Knife Junkie logo on it. So we have a lot of cool uh, merchandise. If this is your kind of thing, definitely check it out. I'm really excited to have uh, as you can imagine, this is my logo. It's exciting to me, but to see it so big printed out on a t-shirt uh, is awesome. And my sister uh, did the designing, so I'm going to have to, I'm going to have to send her one. Anyway, there you have it. Check them out. The, uh, all the merchandise on the, uh, on the Knife Junkie, uh, go to thenifejunkie.com and check it out. Uh, hoodies, uh, mugs, coasters, uh, wall art, all sorts of cool stuff. So, there you have it. Uh, I also wanted to mention that uh, today or yesterday, we got a new uh, gentleman junkie and I wanted to mention him. Thank you so much, Kurt Crownco, for becoming a gentleman junkie supporter of the Knife Junkie podcast on Patreon. Uh, for that, you get, uh, well, you get uh, stickers, you get entered into the uh, monthly knife drawing and uh, all sorts of other perks. You get uh, early and exclusive content, and we're very excited to have you coming along. So thank you, sir. Uh, we appreciate it greatly. Um, so I think that wraps up our, our, uh, our housekeeping up front. Uh, we have a couple of uh, interesting things happening in the knife world that we're going to get to in just a moment here. You're listening to the Knife Junkie podcast, and now here's the Knife Junkie with the Knife Life News. Arno Bernard known for, okay, so Arno Bernard is a knife maker out of South Africa. It's another another hot spot for knives, South Africa. These are four brothers who, um, who have Arno Bernard knives and they were inspired by their father who, uh, who makes knives or made knives. And uh, they are known for their beautiful ornate fo um, uh, fixed blade knives, hunting knives and stuff like that. And then they came out with a a knife called the Ring Calls, which is a uh, which was their first folder, a beautiful slip joint. Um, kind of reminds me a little bit of the uh, um, of the of the Chris Reeve slip joint, just a little bit. And uh, RWL thirty four, beautiful little slip joint. Now they've turned it into a frame lock folder with a three point four inch blade, and it is gorgeous uh, to look at it. It's 
simple. It's in the class of um, kind of some of these very uh, simple lined modern folders, kind of like the Holt knives or, uh, uh, you know, I would put them kind of on the same same, same shelf with these kind of knives. Uh, Gareth Bull, Holt, uh, uh, Skiff, some of these new, beautifully engineered, simply designed, uh, classic uh, looking knives. And uh, they come in all sorts of inlays. And um, so these are gonna be coming out soon. And I gotta say, I, I look at this and uh, I've seen a number of South African makers and like other locations like Poland and Russia, uh, which I feel have a real design look, I feel like South African knives and like there's something in the water there that makes the knives identifiable uh, by location. They don't, I'm not saying that everyone who makes knives in South Africa makes a knife that looks like their neighbors. I think everyone has a different and unique look that I'm, that I'm, uh, you know, tuning into, uh, but I'm seeing a, a South African style and this seems to really capture it. So uh, it's called the I Mamba. And uh, I think I'm falling in love with a knife. <laughs> uh, I, and I think maybe it's that uh, mammoth ivory inlay, I think it is in that picture. And then maybe also the logs in the picture, because what we're looking at is a blend of this old style, you know, with the inlays, with the uh, natural materials, blended into a simple incarnation of the latest and greatest and most common form of knife, the, you know, common form of collectible high-end knife, the titanium frame lock. So uh, it, this is kind of exciting to me. And what else is exciting is that it's four brothers working together to make these these knives. That's kind of unique that four brothers would get along that well, um, that they could actually have a successful business and and create such you know, beautiful work. So anyway, check it out, Arno Bernard Knives. Now this is a Knife News article that I got. We get a lot of stuff from Knife News. Definitely go over there and check them out. As I'm always saying, Ben Schwartz, the main writer over there, uh, finds a way to make anything sound interesting. Like like the latest um, $20 Kershaw release. He will, he will turn that into a gem. So check him out over there. Uh, another thing I wanted to mention is uh, something happening in Knife Right uh, that I saw on the Knife Rights page that's happening in Illinois. Now, we just had uh, we just had our good friend Doug Ritter on the show, and we were talking about uh, talking about Knife Rights issues. And I don't believe we got to Illinois, but uh, this is something that's brand new. They're just uh, released, not released, uh, presented a bill uh, for consideration that would eliminate the need for people who want automatic knives in the state of Illinois to have a firearm owner's identification card. Now, uh, let's see. So they, they got the uh, switchblade ban repealed in 2017, but a big, a big sort of compromise was that you had to have this card, a fire ohm, firearm owner's ID card, which is one of those things that is in Illinois above and beyond having a, a concealed carry permit, which you know, it's kind of like being registered, having a, a gun registry, which, you know, pe people have mixed feelings about. So the, the card in the first place is sort of a controversial thing. But then to own an automatic knife, you have to have one of those cards is a, is a second, second layer of kind of, uh, you know, bureaucratic nonsense. Uh, but the real problem is there are there are 60,000 applications in line. So if you if you are living in Illinois and you decide you're going to apply for a, an FOID card, a firearms owner ID card, to get uh, to get one of these automatic knives, you're you're getting in a very long line. And uh, you know, if you've ever worked around or in government, you know things things can sometimes take their time. So definitely, um, definitely a hurdle there. So this bill will try and get rid of that. And I got to say, people are looking in a lot of different directions right now. So when I when I look at this, I could see people saying, why are we even considering this? This is a non-issue. Or I could see people just saying, fine, and signing it, get just, you know, like, get this gadfly out of the way. You know, we have, we have other things we want to talk about. So hopefully that's what happens. And uh, hopefully people do not have to, you know, go through all that registration and mumbo jumbo just to get uh, just to get themselves an automatic knife now 
if they presented that in my state, would I do it? Um, I don't know. I might. I don't know. What would you? Well, let us know. Call the listener line. Let us know what you think. Call it at 724-466-4487 and just unburden yourself. I know you're the type who finds every excuse to get that knife talk into the everyday conversation. And I'm begging you, please save those relationships because you're going to need them. Call the listener line 724-466-4487. Tell us because we care. Actually, tell us your knife stuff. Tell us your favorite knife, the knife you're excited about, your best best knife and your favorite designer, or maybe you have a, a stupid knife story, something you did that's really dumb that you have to get off your chest. You have to confess kind of, you know, call us, let us know. Bottom line, tell us what's on your mind, your knife mind, that is, and call the listener line 724-466-4487, and we will play it here on the show. And now that we're caught up with Knife Life News, let's hear more of the Knife Junkie podcast. A couple of knives you've heard me talk about lately. Uh, in the last week, if you've tuned into if you tuned into Thursday Night Knives, you saw some of these because, oh, I am very, very excited. Three new knives that have come in. Uh, well, I've gotten five new knives recently that I was excited about. The CRKT. Pilar 3. I got the uh, the concept uh, Pelican that I really dig. But since we last spoke here on the supplemental, I got three others that were kind of, uh, uh, you know, hovering over my location um, in a <laughs> United States Postal Service helicopter, I think for, uh, say, about a, a week. Uh, but the uh, first one here is the Spyderco Yo Jumbo. This knife, uh, I'm not sure why I waited so long. Um, I, I think when it first came out and I was really excited about it, I missed the initial drop and and things got, uh, they got sold out everywhere and then I didn't seek them out because I think I had money tied up in other knives, if you will. But I finally got this. I was lurking around on blade forums and saw this. And I was like, oh my gosh, I got to get it. It was a good price and uh, I'm thrilled with it. As you know, I love the Yojimbo. And this is just a four inch version of it. They did a really good job. I should say Michael Janich, the designer did a really good job of expanding the design. He didn't just take it and say, okay, uh, times 20% or times 15% to make it larger. He reconsidered the ergonomics, reconsidered the blade and, uh, you know, presented something that is quite identifiable as a large Yojimbo but it's also taken on a different form. Now, if you're looking at this and you think the handle looks different from what you've seen, it's because it is. Uh, there's a peak in the handle as it ships, excuse me, right there in the middle of the handle, uh, kind of like a contigo. It, it partitions your fingers into two different uh, swales. And to me, that's not comfortable. I've never cared for that. I like either a neutral, totally neutral handle or individual finger swales. It can, I could even be have grooves for each finger and I would find it more comfortable than having them grouped into two. That's just my personal preference. So I took a Dremel and just sort of uh, knocked the peak off. And if you look in there and you look at the liner, you can also do that with this back peak here. Uh, the liner does not extend up into that uh, G10 peak there. So you can, uh, really grind it all the way down down the line there down and and actually if you look at uh, BJ Hill uh, Hilltop Gear if you go to his uh, YouTube page you'll see that he does this a lot he'll mod modify people's yo jumbos and that's one thing he does he knocks off both peaks on the handle and makes it a straight skinny handle I myself have medium sized hands and they fit perfectly in uh, in this space here so I left that second peak in there so I could get a, a tight full grip, but also know I'm not gonna slide off the end there. Who knows, maybe there's another one in my future and uh, I have BJ do a full mod. He also cuts a choil out there. You know, this knife actually is begging for a choil the way they designed the handle here. I'm not sure why they didn't put one, right? Imagine it right there, just a little cut out there. Or you don't have to imagine it, check out BJ's page. He also cuts the hump off the back of the blade. I'm quite attracted to the hump. I will leave the hump. Um, but this 
portion here, the way this G10 curves, it looks like it's setting uh, setting things up for one of those Spyderco 50-50 swales here, 50% handle, 50% uh, blade. Choil, I mean, not swale. So uh, that's one very excited about. I'm going to turn down this light because it seems to be a little bit blinding on the... Uh, on the polished blade. And, and while you saw the top of my head, you can let me know if I'm balding back here because I can't see back there. And I tell my wife not to be too honest. So uh, there you go. Uh, next is, oh, well, you know what? I'm going to save that one for last. Next, I got from our guest, Doug Ritter. He said I needed to have one of these and sent it to me. Uh, and by these, I mean a mini RSK1. RSK stands for uh, Ritter Survival Knife. Mark one, and last year, 20, I think it was 2020, they released the mini version of it. Here is the, here's the full size version, gives you an idea. If you know the difference between a full size griptilian and a mini griptilian, it's about the same, but a hair longer on the handle, which makes the ergonomics of both of these knives way better, I would say, than the Benchmade. Um, but it's in this purple g -mascus which is so cool. So it's layered gray, black, and purple G10. And then as it's contoured and sculpted, it reveals uh, those different layers in, in colors. And as you, and it looks kind of like wood grain, actually, it's pretty neat. But if you look at the uh, pivot, well, if you look at the whole handle, you'll see a radiating pattern of like sunburst pattern coming from the pivot. That is a, a, a signature, a design signature of of these latest rounds of uh, Ritter survival knives, now made by Hogue in a superior fashion, if you ask me. This has an Able lock, which is an excellent, excellent bar lock, first made popular and invented by Benchmade with the Axis lock. Since the patent has run out and everyone has rushed in, the ones I've experienced, uh, Hogue is, has really, really nailed it. I need to get this knife out of the way before I stab myself. Okay, and lastly, but not leastly, this one is very exciting. Also a masterwork from a former guest or from a guest on the show. That is the Spartan Harzi folder. Actually, two guests on the show. We had Curtis Iovito of, of uh, Spartan Blades, and we've had Bill Harzi on. And... Uh, to me, this is in the perfect knife category because you look at it and it's perfectly symmetrical, per perfectly purpose-driven and just beautiful to look at and perfect in the hand, I gotta say. Uh, you get this nice saber grip. You can get a really nice, like really tight hammer grip. It's great in reverse grip. But if you look at it, you've got this contoured coke bottle shape in both dimensions in its profile here like when you can when it's laying flat on the table you see that extreme sort of curvy coke bottle shape to it and then you have the little diamond tip pommel there it's not a diamond but a little triangular tip pommel and that's the end of the tang poking through the g10 and then if you turn it on its side here you can see that it's also got a coke bottle um shape in this contour, uh, in this uh, aspect. And the grooves spiral around the handle, which is uh, makes for just a great grip. And then these uh, these five jimps on either either side in the finger wells really give this thing a uh, just a feel in the hand like it's it's locked in. And this, of course, is meant for thrusting. So you're pushing and pulling and pushing and pulling. And this sort of these two, these two little finger grip areas with the jimping are really, uh, and, and then also this sort of bird's beak at the end are really necessary for that pulling out action. Um, just a beautiful thing. And of course, this is like, it may as well be a medieval dagger to me because that's, that's about as much use as I'll get out of it. It's, it is not a practical um, knife. It's not, it's just something I had to own because of its beauty. And um, 
that's kind of a weird thing. It's a luxury item for me. Uh, hopefully it's never anything more than a luxury item. You know that if this becomes more than a luxury item, uh, something has gone terribly wrong. So um, I guess you could say that a lot of, about a lot of my collection. So very, very excited to have been lucky enough to get this, uh, this Spartan Harzy. Uh, it's a very expensive knife. And uh, the story behind this purchase rather be podcasting. Uh, the story behind this is I was thinking about this knife, kind of jonesing for the knife. I decided I gave myself a little dare. I'm like, if you go onto blade forums right now and go to the knife exchange and then go to sold by individuals and fixed blade knives. And if there's a Spartan Harzy in there, full, uh, a dagger, you're going to buy it. That's just what's happening. And I was like, okay, yeah, I'll do that. Of course, I've never ever seen one in that in that uh, in that page. I think people buy this knife and they keep it because it's extraordinary. Uh, on the whole, I, I open up the page. What's the very first thing? It's this Spartan Harzy dagger for a very good price. The only caveat was it was coming from Hawaii, so it was going to take like two days longer to get here than if it, it were in the uh, uh, contiguous states. So uh, I'll. All things considered, I got a screaming deal on it, and uh, it was unused and came in perfect condition. Now, it came in with this, you know, kind of cheesy sheath. It's not cheesy. It'll do, definitely do, uh, but it's one of these nylon tactical sheaths, and I don't care for it much, uh, but they do have a, a leather one that you can buy. They also have Kydex. The Kydex is sold out, but really what I want is the leather anyway. You can get a black or brown leather sheath for this thing. So I'm going to get the brown. And, you know, that is a fashion choice. I got to be 100% honest. I like the way it looks. And that's it. And so, you know, again, luxury item. And how do I justify it? Well, I justify it because I'm showing it to you now and telling you that it's great. And if you've ever been sitting on the fence, I'm telling you to get off the fence. It is an awesome knife. Um for what it is, which is a collectible, or heaven forbid, uh, an excellent, excellent tool. There you go right there, uh, looking right on screen. I mentioned before the Don't Take Dull for an Answer themed uh, gear and t-shirts that Jim designed. Check it out right there. Definitely go check it out. And if you see, uh, it says theknifejunkie.com slash dull. Uh, dull 2 stands for the dark stuff, the dark, uh, dark t-shirts <coughs> with the dark background. Dull one or just dull, I can't remember actually, is the white. So uh, two different pages to go to, check them out. And uh, when those arrive, uh, dull, just straight up dull. Okay, for the white t-shirts, knifejunkie.com slash dull. I will be receiving mine this week, presumably. I haven't gotten a shipping notice from them. Uh, the different gear with the different logos ship from different uh, places. So they come at different times, I guess. Um, uh, so keep your eye out for that. So now I want to show you uh, I want to show you these 10 knives that have been with me forever. And these aren't all of the knives that have been with me forever. For instance, I have a lot of slip joints that my grandpa gave me when I was young that maybe have not gotten a lot of uh, use or whatever. I'm not showing you every single one. These are just kind of the real um, the real standouts and the ones that mean the most to me. And this first one is probably the one on all of, uh, of this whole list that means the most to me. It's the oldest, and I've had it for a long time. And here it is. This, here, let me turn it right ways. And I'll hold it. I'll hold it like that. So this is a Jean Case Cutlery Company uh, from Little Valley, New York. Skinner from my grandfather. And... Uh, as you can see, it's got an, an old patina on it, and it looks like he ground it on a on one of those uh, on a wheel, or maybe I did when I was a kid. Geez, I hope that wasn't me. <laughs> it's got the beautiful stacked leather handle, and this says Jean Case Cut Co. Little Valley, New York. It's this beautiful Skinner shape. When I was a kid. I thought it looked like a Sinbad. I thought it looked like the kind of sword Sinbad would carry just in a knife. I really, really loved it. It's got jimping back here. Yes, jimping was a thing before the modern age. 
and uh, it's in very good shape. This used to be hanging in my grandfather's shop. He had the ultimate shop with every single tool known to man, and this was hanging on the wall near the door. And he told me that he he skinned a bear with it, but I I always took that to mean he like he he took a bear down with it. Um, of course, I sort of figured uh, since then that that it was actually he meant he he told me that he skinned a bear. Now the thing that I love the most about this is the sheath. If you look up here, he put his name, Robert Tignorelli. I am named after him, Robert Tignorelli. And then here you can see 1937. And then right here you see Catskill Mountains, Tannersville, New York. So that's where he was living at the time. This was what, five years before my mom was born. Sorry, mom, uh, for revealing your age. And, you know, he was married to my grandmother and kicking it in Catskill Mountains, teaching art and uh, and hunting and skinning bears. And uh, so he has his name in there, the year, the place. So this is definitely very, very prized possession for me. I, my grandfather was... A, both of my grandfathers were amazing men and I got to know them both very well and they were both very different and I got amazing things from both of them, uh, life lessons and such. And uh, I'm, I'm very, very blessed, uh, very, very uh, excited to have that, uh, you know, piece of, me uh, that memento from him. All right, I'm gonna stop or I'll start crying, Grandpa. All right, so next is a knife that my brother Vic gave me when I was little, and it was a cast off from him. He uh, he had it, used it, we banged around with it in the woods, and then he gave it to me at some point, and I was extremely grateful. Uh, now at the time, in the 80s when this was purchased, I'm not sure where he got it. Uh, he maybe got it through the mail, or maybe PSS, Public Safety Supply, which is a no longer existent, uh, no longer extant, um, what do you call it, Army Navy surplus store in Mayfield, Ohio. Um, the Austrian commando knife. That always happens. So this is a, um, now this design is manufactured by Glock and it's got a saw back and I bet it's way stouter than this. Um, this is a great knife and I, I don't mean that it's not stout. You look at the blade steel, it's pretty thick. It's, it's like three eighths of an inch thick. And, uh, but the handle like when we were kids, the handle would always fall off and then the guard would slide off the tang and uh, the cap came off the back and you can kind of see in there, there's no, well, you can't, I guess, there's no screw in there. There's no nut to, to lock it down with. So it would just kind of fly out. So, you know, my brother and I would put all sorts of putty and crap in there and try and wedge it in there. And, um, you know, it would do in a pinch. Uh, we learned, or I learned at some point that this opens beer bottles. That's nice. I think that's what it's for because it's curved. Um, you have uh, this plastic handle that's formed in such a way that it mimics the K-bar grip with the with the grooves kind of cut into it. And um, I have thought and considered many times getting the modernized Glock version of this, but it's just it's kind of low lowish on my list. And I have this one, and this one means way more to me in its all of its dull glory. Actually, at some point I actually put an edge on it. Uh, but the sheath is one of these tension fit sheaths. It's like spring tension. This, this thing, the spring slides in here and sticks on there. And this always pops out too. So I would always put a little silly putty or something there to like, or fun tack they used to call it. Put it there and, and keep it in. This knife when I lived in New York, was always hanging on the back of my door. See this, uh, this, this uh, hole down here for lanyards or, or letting water out. I would just screw it to the back of the door, and it would hang upside down. In case anyone was ever rushing me at the door, I could pull this off and, and go all Austrian commando on them. So uh, yeah, thanks, Vic. Awesome knife. Always a prized possession. So then one year, I don't know. Um, mid mid late 80s like maybe 87 or 88 i saw in the sharper image catalog that would the prized sharper image catalog oh my god i love that thing showed up uh one day and it had the classic 
Gerber Mark II knife in it. And I had seen the Gerber Mark II knife featured in the movie Aliens when uh, Ash does that knife thing where he puts his hand on the table and or puts uh, he puts uh, Bill Packman's hand on the table, puts his hand over it and then starts doing the knife tappy tappy trick and uh, and cuts himself. Anyway, he's using a, a Gerber Mark II. I thought it was such a cool knife. Saw it in sharper image. Mentioned it to my mom and she got it for Christmas. I thought, man, you know, my parents are so cool and they are. Uh, this is what it looks like years later. And there's a reason why the stitching is all red is that there is rust <laughs> infused. Uh, this is the rustiest knife and there's nothing I've ever been able to do about it. It's missing a quillion because I had a martial arts teacher uh, teach us how to throw knives once and I decided I'd bring my coolest uh, knife at the time and and immediately on my first throw uh, knocked the quillion right off because this is cast aluminum this handle but look at this blade I i'm sure they've changed things since the 80s but and this is with some of the rust knocked off i featured this knife on thursday night knives and when i pulled it out i pulled it out over a white piece of paper and and it snowed rust on that white piece of paper now you say, why don't you just sand it down or, or t hit it up with some flits and some steel? Okay, I've done all that stuff. I've done all of it. This steel was born to rust. There is nothing you can do about whatever the particular steel was that they were using on these Gerber Mark IIs in the mid 80s. Now, see that serial number? I remember I copied it down in my journal at the time, my sketchbook at the time. And I'm like, if anything ever happens to this, I'll be able to track it down with its serial number. Well, something did happen to it. I broke it and <laughs> it rusted, but uh, it's a disaster of a knife, but I still love it. And I love the design and I've considered getting, uh, you can still buy these. Um, they were originally designed by a uh, an army general who did a lot of special forces stuff in Vietnam. And it was a favored design by the, the SOG guys. The, the, uh, let's see, put this. Okay, so next. A junior in high school, I get the Cold Steel Master Tanto. And this thing, as I've mentioned many times before, the sheath is starting to... There's, this sheath is going down a, down the drain, but I will someday get a new leather one if I can find one. But this knife has been with me since uh, 1988 or so, 87 or 88, and it's been by my bed ever since, everywhere I've been. College, um, you know, Philadelphia, New York, uh, here, always, always next to the bed. And uh, yeah, I mean, you know the knife. It This is the knife that put cold steel on the map. And they still make it. This is the, look at this. If you look at the pommel on my particular version, my old version, the hole is slightly off center. It's not what well, they didn't drill it right exactly in the right place. Or they did, but they hafted down the brass uh, dis disproportion, unequally. Uh, this this uh, sort of rubberized handle, almost 30 years later. 30, over 30 years later, I guess, is still, you know, still working and it's still fine. I, I, I always kind of wondered if it would start to disintegrate. It feels slightly overly tacky, if you know what I mean. It feels like rubber that, it feels like old rubber. It's not dry and cracked. It's feeling like maybe a little sticky, but phew, all the better to stay in your hands when you're vanquishing your foes, you know, that, that come in at midnight uninvited, right? Unfortunately, I, I fear that would be my instinct. <laughs> Instead of reaching for something more potent than a knife, be like, oh, oh, I better grab the Tanto. But uh, I love this thing and uh, three eighths of an inch. And this will always be with me uh, in my collection. Never, never get rid of this knife. Uh, I remember my friend Mike introduced it to me by saying, all the, um, you know, this is a knife used by the CIA and you, you can punch it through car doors. And, and in my mind at the time, I was like, yeah, of course, man. CIA agents are always punching through doors with their knives. And what are they going to use? Of course. Like, look at this thing. It's awesome. Okay. So another knife from the same era that has that same 
sort of rubbery material handle was my first tactical folder. And I'm calling it that, and I'm sticking with that. And it's because it looks like it. And it's this SOG. Now, it's a little one, and I don't think it's a wildcat. I, don't, I think they just called this a lockback. But I bought it in Boston in 1991, summer of 1991, at a knife shop that was on, uh, um, oh, what's that street in Boston? Their, their main drag with all the cool record shops. Record shops, how do you like how old I sound? With all the cool, you know, spots. Uh, Newberry Street, or no, it was on Commonwealth Avenue. It, it doesn't matter, but the point is it was a knife store in Boston, and I don't think those exist anymore. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. But I was in love with that recurve and that shape. I had already seen the Sog Bowie in Terminator 2. And I knew I loved that knife, uh, but it was way out of reach at the time. And then I saw this in this knife store. And I was like, I'm going to commemorate my summer here in Boston. I was there to go to art school for the summer. I'm going to commemorate my time here. I'm going to buy this knife and I'm going to carry it all the time. And I did. I bought it and carried it a lot. The rubber handle, you know, I didn't carry it with a fob at the time, but this rubber handle allowed it, you know, since it's kind of tacky in texture and knurled, allowed it to stay upright in my pocket. So I never had that problem with it kind of slumping over sideways. Um, it was not sharp when I got it and I didn't know how to sharpen it for years and years and years and years. And then the past couple of years, I, I found it and sort of rediscovered it amongst my personal effects and put a nice edge on it. And so, uh, this lives in my main collection now, and it is my oldest tactical folder. Let me know in the comments if you know exactly what this little model is called. I'm pretty sure it's not a Wildcat, but it came in that series. As I pause for some delicious black wake-up beverage. So next, from that era, also a gift from my brother. Uh, this was for... I think graduating uh, college. Uh, this is the USMC K-Bar. And a very cool thing about this K-Bar is that it was at the time, a which would have been 93 or 94, it was a limited release that was based on exactly how they were making them during World War II. So uh, it has all the hallmarks, the staples in the blade. It has, it has the... Uh, now, I'm not sure if, if this, the way they stamped it, is exactly how it was back in the day. Something tells me they didn't stamp K-Bar in it or USMC. Maybe they, they had the uh, Eagle Globe and Anchor there, but uh, I'm not sure about the sheath. Uh, but the knife, for sure. Now, this knife uh, came in a box that had a fold-out. I wish I still had this. This was in the era when I didn't keep boxes, but it had a fold-out plan like a, a copy of the plan for this knife, um, like the tac uh, the technical drawing with all the measurements and stuff. And uh, so this is how they were producing it during World War II. And it's a little bit thinner than, than they are doing now. Uh, the thing that I love the most is that the swedge was very acute, it's sharp. It's not as quite as sharp as the primary edge, but it's basically, well, it's sharp. It's very sharp, actually. You can probably shave hair with it. I mean, I have touched it up a little bit, but it it shows up as a double-edged fighting knife or a, a sharpened clip point knife. And that's how they made them. And now uh, that clip is a little bit straighter from here to here. It's a less of a scooped out uh, clip there. And it's thick. It's not double-edged. And, uh, you know, it's more utility-oriented, less fighting-oriented. That double edge there is obviously a fighting, uh, for fighting applications. I think, uh, all things considered, they figured people use their K-bars more to pry open things and to, and, you know, than, than they do for back cutting in a, in a knife fight. So they, they didn't, uh, they don't sharpen the swedge anymore. But, that's what I love about this one. Plus, my brother gave it to me, and it's uh, it's also been with me for a long, long time. What a great knife these K-Bars are. If you don't have one, they're not going to break the bank too much. Or 
you could save up for them and it wouldn't take you too long probably to save up. I think they're under a hundred bucks, uh, the, the current day K bars. One thing that always stuck in my craw about this design was how the, the blade is a little bit offset from the handle. See that? But that that's just me and my eye. That's a through tang and it's held on the back with a pin that goes through uh, the pommel, through the end of that tang. Uh, you should check out the Forged in Fire uh, episode where they have to build a K-bar and you really see how they're, how they're constructed. K-bar, uh, you know, an iconic knife, American knife, not only because it's been the main service knife for uh, since World War II across all the services, uh, but it's also based on the Bowie knife, a classic, classic American knife. And uh, also an interesting little tidbit is that Space Force is actually a real thing. And uh, uh, um, K-Bar is, um, is making knives for them. And when I say Space Force is actually a real thing, I, I think it's cool. Believe me, I'm not crazy about the name Space Force, but it makes sense. Air Force, Space Force. What I'm really not crazy about is that they're called Guardians. Uh, like Guardians of the Galaxy or just, I don't know. It's, it's a little unspecific. But anyway, I'll let that slide because I'm generous that way. Okay, so next I have the um, Cold Steel. You know, there's a bit of Cold Steel in this collection. Cold Steel Voyager Tanto from 1998. I was working on independent films in New York City. And I was working on one called Judy Berlin, which actually won at Cannes for Best Independent Film in 1999, I think it was. Uh, I was second, second assistant director. Yes, that's a thing. Second, second assistant director. It was a fun job. I got to uh, usher the actors around and, uh, you know, kind of keep people on time and stuff. It was kind of fun. Okay. But anyway, I figured this is an important job. This is my first job on a film. I'm going to need to get a new knife. That's how I've always been. New pair of shoes, new knife, or, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to need this on the job. So I went to Roseland Martial Arts, which at the time was on in Times Square. It was a great big martial arts store that had a huge long knife cabinet and every cold steel that was made at the time. Uh, incidentally, you can't do that in New York anymore unless you go to Paragon Sports uh, and buy a, a Chris Reeve or some sort of custom knife. Um, yeah, no, no buying knives in New York now, but this I bought this was $99, I remember, and I was like, you know, that's still a lot of money, still a lot of money to me. That's a hundred bucks. A uh, hundred bucks I didn't really have, but I bought it, and a uh, hundred bucks I didn't need to spend on a knife. But as you can see, it's gotten tons of use. This is a four-inch blade, and this has the uh, integral Zytel handles, or no, Grivery, um, Grivery clip. Cool thing about how they did the Grivery clip back then is that it was sort of uh, integral to the width of the handle. So if you look over by the pivot, you see how wide it is. They kept that width and scooped down here so your pocket would would uh, slide right under that clip. Clip's all right. It rides real high and it's not very, doesn't offer very much tension and had a tendency to grab on stuff and actually pull your knife out. So actually, that's why I put that um, lanyard on there. For that, and also for protecting the hand if if you had to thrust with it to stop your hand from sliding up. Because though these Voyagers were, you know, known as tactical knives, uh, they had no sort of finger protection before they had their redesign in 20, 2012 or something like that. So yeah, Voyager Tanto. They made a large and a smaller one at the time. And I got that one. Same era, but this one I got on uh, on Knife Center, I remember. And this is the Vakir, or the El Hombre, the Cold Steel El Hombre. It's the precursor to the uh, four-inch Voyager Vaquero. And as you can see, that Vaquero uh, blade shape has changed over the years. Uh, in this early version, it had a real extreme curve on the back but the S curve on the of of the blade itself is not as extreme. It just is on a different angle down. Uh, now it waves more. There's more of a wave and recurve in that blade. This uh, with the serrations is just a beast beast of a cutter. 
It's still uh, still stained. This blade is stained from a camping trip I took where I was eating tofu lin, which is a sort of, well, sort of tofu that's got flavoring in it. It stained the blade, and I, I knew from that point on that tofu just weren't for me. Just kidding. I actually like it. Uh, got a little purple fob on there. And uh, these pre-triad locks by Cold Steel, even though they were not triads, are still very, very strong back locks. And look at the jimping on this. This is really cool. I, I like how they did this jimping. It's file work. Looks like file work. So a great knife. I always thought the um I always thought that the uh what do you call it? Thumb stud was a little bit too close to the pivot. But now that it's you know 25 years old or whatever, 30 years old, it's much easier to flip open. God, how wait, my math sucks. I'm sorry, guys. Uh 20 years old. A little bit over 20, not 30. Not that old. All right, so two more knives, both fixed blades, and both from CRKT. Not a brand you see too much on this channel. But like I've always said, CRKT is one of the best, if not the best companies out there, getting designs by amazing designers, custom designers, in the hands of the hoi polloi, like you and me. People who want to pay 40 bucks for a knife, 20 bucks for a knife, can still get high design from CRKT. They're just not getting uh, titanium and the, and the super steels. They're getting uh, budget steels and, and uh, stainless handles and that kind of thing. And if you can, if you can handle that, uh, you got a lot of great options from CRKT. First, uh, this one I got in the early 90s, or no, no, yeah, something like that, mid, mid uh, early 2000s, I mean. This is a uh, CRKT Al Polkowski and Casper uh, collaboration. Uh, Casper did a lot of designing for CRKT in the early days. I'm sorry, I, I'm forgetting his first name, but I know he... Uh, cannot remember his first name. And Al Polkowski was a custom tactical fixed blade knife maker in the 90s, uh, or I, I was aware of him, and I think he was thriving the most in the 90s. He's now dead, may he rest in peace. But I met him at the uh, New York Custom Knife Show, um, and <laughs> he was a, his table was full of knives that looked just like this, except double-edged, little incredible flat, tactical stash on your body knives just really al polkowski knives were just so cool you got to check them out he was an ornery guy man uh, I, I shouldn't say i just mean on that day who knows what but he was not happy to talk to me so it doesn't matter he had a lot of customers and i don't even know what kind of stupid stuff i was trying to ask him um but crkt did this beautiful version of it. This now lives in my wife's office, right uh, on her desk. It's very, very sharp chisel ground edge. If you look on this side, there's barely an edge and you flip it, just like a lot of knives that are serrated. You've got uh, a chisel edge and those nasty serrations. I just love this knife. I love the design. I always wished I had managed to get an Al Polkowski knife one like this, uh, but you know, this will do until the real thing gets here. So uh, that is number nine. And then the last one lives on our bar next to the liquor. This is to defend our liquor. Uh, this is uh, designed by uh, also a CRKT and also designed by a famous designer. Uh, this is a Williams Hisatsu. And this was the original one that came out. Not sure what the steel is on this. Came very sharp, and then I just went to town and decided to make it utterly, terribly, ridiculously sharp. I convexed that edge with a fine sandpaper, and it's just incredibly wicked sharp. And it's one of those knives that I forget I have. Actually, this is the knife that inspired me to do this topic because I was cleaning yesterday and wiping down the bar and I bumped it and I see it all the time, but I don't think about it. And I, uh, you know, pull, pulled it out from between the bottles. It's kind of stashed there. 
and pulled it out. And I was like, man, this is a, just an amazing knife. And I love William's designs. He's a, uh, a, a, a Japanese martial arts expert and all of his uh, designs are based on Japanese style knives. And this Hisatsu, it's like just so wicked and it's all shiny. And I love the shape of the handle. For a while, I had some paracord on there for extra grip, but there's no need for the extra grip. Um, this is kind of a grippy, sort of rubbery handle anyway. This line, since it first came out, has expanded radically. They have all sorts of different uh, William-designed uh, um, Hisatsus and Japanese-style knives that look a lot like this in both fixed blade and folder. They get much larger than this and much smaller. So if this knife shape interests you, it's sort of like super elongated tanto, really check it out. Check out the CRKT uh, um, line. And then if you have a little money to spare, definitely check out the Williams line. They have these knives, uh, knives like this and, and others uh, produced by, you know, the top end knife manufacturers and their designs are just mm, mm, mm. modern, but with a, with a tip of the hat to the, to the ancient Japanese stuff. So, well, thanks for coming along on this journey. No, this was not a journey. This was a voyage. I'm on a voyage, people. I am not on a journey. So thanks for coming on this voyage through my top 10 uh, oldest, mm, uh, the, the top 10 knives that have been in my collection the longest, that, that are most prized. I'm, as, I'm, as I'm laying them out, I'm realizing that they represent things, uh, a history that, uh, well, as you get older and you do things, uh, a lot of stuff gets pushed out the back end of your, of your hard drive. Uh, and or, or, or goes up to the cloud and it's harder to access. But if you have old things around you to help you remember, for me, it's knives and it's artwork that I've produced. If you have those things, you can you can tap back into into memories. So that's my excuse for keeping all of these knives. And actually, I have a whole new sort of movement in my collection happening where I have knives from people that I've interviewed and talked, uh, you know, talked with on the podcast. And to me, those are very, very valuable. Also, I have a whole sort of sub collection of gift knives, knives that I maybe never would have thought to get myself, but someone else got it for me. And that meant so much to me that uh, I'll never get rid of them. And I have a lot of them. So anyway, I find all these different little um, subcategories of collecting interesting and, and, when you look back in your old stuff at your old stuff, it can kind of act like reading a diary, except not as embarrassing. You don't have to like remember certain things. You can just remember the good things. So uh, make sure you take care of your knives, make sure that they, uh, that you keep them around, not only for usage and, uh, and, and for enjoyment, but also for um, so that you can look at them down the road and remember now. Um, Anyway, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. So uh, thanks for joining us. Join us next week on the Midweek Supplemental and we'll have another interesting topic for discussion. Also join us for the Sunday interview show when we speak with Ken Onion, a legend in the field. And uh, you'll know why once you hear him. What a cool guy. Uh, so also he lives in paradise, by the way. He showed us a little bit of that. So join us then and join us always. And for Jim, uh, working his magic behind the switcher, uh, thanks, Jim. We all appreciate it. I want to say thank you for watching. And uh, this week, make sure that you don't take dull for an answer. The GetUpside app is your way to get cash back on your gas purchases. GetUpside is an app you put on your smartphone, and whenever you need to get gas, search your area for savings, claim your discount, fill up your tank, and then take a picture of the receipt with your phone. And that's it. You've just got cash back. Visit theknifejunkie.com forward slash save on gas to get the app and start saving. Again, that's theknifejunkie.com slash save on gas.
Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at theknifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487, and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Thank you.